circumstantial evidence, meaning that contextualization of everything. Can I actually hear it from the horse's mouth? And to Renato's point, it's so important, is the idea here that if you have the opportunity to question the President of the United States, or any witness for that matter, you need to be able to assess their credibility, look them in the eyes, have that gut reaction, and then base that off of and compare it to what they've already written. And I'm also very surprised, and I don't know if you are as well, that the President's team, who's been so concerned about what they call a perjury trap, would put in front of Bob Mueller's team a written statement and then allow the president to go rogue, perhaps, in his oral statement to follow up on those things. That, by definition, would probably be a contradiction for them. Yeah, such a great point. They don't want him to sit down. I mean, they've been honest about that. Rudy Giuliani is honest about that. But they, uh, you know, it, uh, all the reporting suggests that he continues to want to sit down because he thinks that he can sway or persuade the investigators to come around to his way of thinking. Uh, Renato, you're a former federal prosecutor, you say that you've already seen enough evidence. What does that mean? Well, I, you know, I actually wrote a piece in January in Politico magazine where I kind of laid out, and Laura was mentioning what she called the circumstantial evidence, but all the evidence that we've seen of the president's intent, you know, not only, you know, the firing of James Comey, pressuring the attorney general to recuse himself, telling the White House counsel, Don McGahn, to fire uh, Robert Mueller at one point. And just all sorts of statements by the president, you know, angry uh, about uh, the, you know, the existence of this investigation and, and very much desiring to help Michael Flynn, helping others in that investigation, uh, engaging in, um, you know, talks of pardons to undermine the investigation, et cetera. There's a variety of evidence that shows that the president has the intent to undermine this investigation. We see it every day on Twitter, if you log into but, Twitter. Well, that but means, but that, that to you means obstruction of, you, you think this is officially obstruction of justice or no? I do. I, I frankly think the evidence is very strong that the president is. But, but what about justice. the other side of that, which is that he may want to undermine it. He may he may opine from the cheap seats or in his case, the, the first row gold plated seat uh, about the investigation. But he is the chief executive and executive power allows him to fire Mueller, allowed him to fire Jim Comey. That's within his purview. So isn't this really a question of interpretation? And that's why what they're after here is so important is to try to understand what his intent was. We know what he's said publicly about this. Uh, so what more is there to know? Well, he certainly has the power to do whatever he wants regarding hiring and firing. But just like it would be unlawful for him to fire someone because of their race or because of their religion, uh, it's also unlawful for the president to fire someone in order to obstruct an investigation. And so while he has the power to fire people, the power to... Right, but he can know, say tell, in the case of uh, Comey, he, that's not what he did. He, he had a basis by Rosenstein to fire him for cause. And then he went on television a day later or a few days later and said that wasn't why he did it, right? Right. He's planning to fire him anyway. Right. Laura, how do you so see his, it? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I think he is in many ways hiding behind what Gregory is talking about. Gregory Gregory's talking about the idea of, well, if I really wanted to put my thumb on the scale, I would simply fire the man who oversees and sanctions the conduct of Robert Mueller and gives him the okay or the nay, and that's Rod Rosenstein. Obviously, talking to uh, Attorney General Jeff Session, who has recused himself, and saying the word should to him is what he's saying. No, if I wanted to impact it, I don't go to the man who's recused himself. I go to the man who actually makes the decisions of whether to go forward to a grand jury and seek indictments of this particular person. Having said that, I think the president fails miserably if he wants to get into a semantics argument about the idea of, well, I said should. I didn't say that he must or he shall or direct him to do anything wrong. When you find yourself arguing about the form and not the substance of what you're doing, you are playing playing a losing man's game. But I'm very interested in the idea of, of whether legally it will make a difference. And again, remember, this is only going to be a legal process to a certain degree, right? This is going to become a political process whenever a report goes to Congress. This difference between what the president says, which puts us in unique territory because of the use of Twitter and because he, he just, he, he, he says so many unconventional and unusual things, but what he actually does which is, you know, he's given Mueller plenty of room. He wants to sit down with him and do an interview, so he wants to cooperate despite all the railing against the investigation he does. You know, if I can just say, 
no prosecutor, and I think Renato, you'd probably agree, no prosecutor endeavors as their end game to have an obstruction of justice case. That yeah. is a claim that you would add on to the more meatier matters. And the reason for that is, why would you give somebody the gift of saying, all right, your endeavor to try to stop my investigation has in fact done just that. I will give you the gift of an obstruction charge and ignore all the actual underlying criminal activity that you did not want me to see. And so while the public may look at this and say, well, he's got enough to go forward in this charge, why not go forward? Because he's not trying to end there. If there is other information he he can uncover, he should. He's under his directive to do so. An obstruction may be an right. additional claim, but certainly should not be his end game. And why does he keep acting, the president, in a way that makes it look like he's done something wrong? Which is, you know, all of this, this question of obstruction of justice, his tweets, his firing Comey, makes it look like he's done something wrong when he claims he hasn't. Your final thought, Renato? Yeah, he, this is a political process, as David suggested, and that's why he keeps trying to undermine the investigation publicly, because he needs to influence the Republican senators who are going to be the jurors in a potential yeah. impeachment, and their constituents and their constituents' opinions are what matter. That's right. That's important. Renato, Laura, thank you both thank you. very much. So, set extra $250 million towards election security ahead of the midterm elections. Given the Russian attack on the 2016 election, are lawmakers in the Trump administration taking this seriously enough? Joining us now is Democratic Senator Amy Klobuchar of Minnesota. Good morning, Senator. Thanks, Allison. Why did Republicans vote down that measure? Well, you'd have to ask them. Um, what did but... they share with you on, in terms of their thinking? <laughs> I think we've been very frustrated, especially by the White House's continual denial of what happened here. We do have the uh, intelligence director, Dan Coats, has made it very clear that this happened. He said the Russians are getting bolder. He said uh, that the lights are blinking red, uh, and we have to get ready. This election is 96 days away. And so what we have done here is, first of all, despite this um, rejection of this money, a few months ago, we got $380 million right out to the states, and I worked on that with Senator Langford, Republican from Oklahoma. And now our bill is getting marked up August 15th with a lot of pushing, uh, which would really set out some rules of the road, requiring backup paper ballots, something really important. Fourteen of our states either have partial ones or don't have them at all. Um, if people are going to use federal money for election equipment. If states are, then they should have backup paper ballots. Secondly, audits, that's required so we can check on elections after the fact and make sure that they uh, were legal and that they match up with the votes. And then the final thing is to make sure that when these hacks occur, you don't wait a year, like what happened last time, to let the states know that hacks are going on in other states. There's no other way for them to protect themselves. Look, we know that the president, for whatever reason, doesn't take this seriously. He's called this all a hoax many times. And so are there things that Congress um, is doing right now? What do you say to the American public about whether or not the midterms will be secure from Russian interference, or do you need the president to get on board? Well, we would have needed better coordination months and months ago instead of having it be a rush uh, right now. But I believe that despite all of these tweets and all of the misinformation that's been out there, our job right now is to do everything we can leading up to those elections. And that means Homeland Security has to be on top of every attempted hack, let the states know they now have classified status for a number of these state election officials so information can be shared with them. Um, I also think we should pass our bill. It would send a message to the country. I believe we're going to get it out of the Rules Committee on August 15th, and then it should immediately go to the floor. There's a similar version in the House. To send this message, one, it's required by law to share info. Two, get those backup paper ballots. You have 14 states that don't have them yet. And number three, make sure that we have audits so we can check this. Um, Russia is going to be watching, and we just hope they're not going to be hacking, because they know which states aren't prepared. I mean, it sounds like you're hoping against hope. How confident are you, if you could give us perhaps a percentage right now, um, that these elections will be secure? I can't give that percentage. I just know that last time, 21 states, there were attempts to hack into 21 states, and in the last uh, indictment out of the Justice Department, out of the Mueller investigation, 500,000 voters had their data 
stolen, basically. Private information was hacked into. So it is not just about messing around with the votes, although do remember in 1923 it was Stalin that said, um, as head of the Communist Party in Russia, it doesn't matter who votes, what matters is who counts the votes. Mm -hmm. Well, 95 years later, that's still what they're focused on. So yes, our elections must be secure, but we also have to protect people's private information, everything from power grids to bank accounts. Our country has to get its act together when it comes to cyber security. This is an attack from another country, and we cannot expect a state like, say, to uh, the political world and being uh, treating George H.W. Bush uh, many